Coming up. Really? This was said by a law professor in a publicized panel discussion on a podcast? And we're supposed to take her seriously? Welcome back to Political Spirits. I'm your host, Franklin Rye. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine, too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Let's talk about how the Democrat leadership in the House of Representatives is continuing to embarrass themselves with the witnesses in this impeachment inquiry. This past week, we moved from a parade of government bureaucrats with no firsthand knowledge of the material allegations of the Democrats against President Trump to a new parade consisting of law professors with no firsthand knowledge of the material allegations of the Democrats against President Trump. Yeah, I know this is not a purely legal proceeding, but I haven't seen something quite so devoid of compliance with legal standards since the last time I watched an episode of Matlock. Now, I know that's going back a bit, so for those of you who've never watched that show, Matlock was an attorney played by Andy Griffith who had the ridiculous habit of conducting a direct examination of a witness by saying, quote, now, I think, close quote, to which, if not for the standards of judicial decorum, the correct response would be for both the judge and the opposing attorney to stand up and shout, ask your question, nobody cares what you think. But with these witnesses, once again, with no firsthand knowledge of the material allegations of the Democrats, we're supposed to listen to their opinions about whether the evidence collected supports impeachment of the president. Now, much of the country has watched the endless parade of talking heads on cable news and the Internet for the last three years explaining how Donald Trump's election and his actions, characteristics, and views represent an existential threat to the planet, its population, and the universe as a whole. We've basically been told we elected Thanos. So I had no doubt that the Democrats would find members of academia who would testify that the evidence presented so far supports impeachment and maybe even proves that Donald Trump was the gunman on the grassy knoll and rather than Ted Cruz was also the Zodiac killer. But for God's sake, with a nearly endless stream of academics who dislike Donald Trump, you would think the Democrats would have enough to choose from that they wouldn't put up a professor whose visceral opposition to President Trump had been documented multiple times online and in the media. But to their discredit and my amusement, apparently they couldn't. Stanford law professor Pamela Carlin despises President Trump so much that she stated online that she crossed the street in Washington, D.C. to avoid walking in front of the Trump Hotel. Got that? She was so disgusted by being in the presence of the Trump name on a building that she crossed the street to avoid being near it. Are you kidding me? I can't even imagine taking my dislike of an American president to that length. I thought Jimmy Carter was a horrible president, and there's certainly evidence in the horrific performance of the American economy during his term for the position that he's a horrible president. But I can't imagine diverting my travel through Georgia to avoid being near his peanut farm. My disappointment with President Obama is extreme to say the least. In my view, the things that he did wrong in which the media refused to investigate and cover were nearly endless. But I can't imagine refusing to visit Hawaii because he grew up there or visit Martha's Vineyard because he just bought a mansion there. Professor Pamela Carlin is apparently suffering from full-on TDS, Trump Derangement Syndrome. Are you having a hard time believing she actually said that? I understand how you could be skeptical. But the video's online. She said it at a 2017 American Constitutional Society panel discussion. The exact quote is, quote, 
I came in from the airport yesterday, and I got off the bus from Dulles down at L'Enfant Plaza, and I walked up to the hotel, and as I was walking past what used to be the old post office building and is now Trump Hotel, I had to cross the street, of course. Close quote. But there's more. Carlin isn't just disgusted by President Trump. She apparently has disdain for conservatives in general and isn't shy about expressing it. What did she say? Well, on a live panel on a podcast referred to as Versus Trump, Ms. Carlin said that, quote, liberals tend to cluster more. Conservatives, especially very conservative people, tend to spread out more, perhaps because they don't even want to be around themselves, close quote. Really? This was said by a law professor in a publicized panel discussion on a podcast, and we're supposed to take her seriously? She postulates that conservatives don't like each other, and that's why they don't cluster together. It's even worse than that, because she phrased it as, quote, they don't even want to be around themselves, close quote. Maybe Professor Carlin will be the Democrat nominee for president, because she can build on Hillary Clinton's deplorables, quote, with a conservative's hate themselves, quote. What's more shocking is not the fact that a law professor, when discussing a very serious subject, would make such a dismissive and unserious comment, apparently attempting to explain a very complicated issue, population distribution in the U.S. What's shocking is that the Democrats called her up to testify. They had to know this was out there. Why would they call her? Not only did they risk her prior comments being exposed, thus exposing her extreme bias and calling into question the basis for her opinions, but they risked her saying something else in her testimony that would be harmful to their cause and which would be fueled by her overwhelming bias against President Trump. Sure enough, she did. Professor Carlin stated in her testimony, in response to a question regarding comparisons that can be made between King's and President Trump's conduct, Professor Carlin said, quote, The Constitution says there can be no titles of nobility, so while the president can name his son Baron, he can't make him a baron. Close quote. Carlin seemed clearly proud of her comment at the time she made it, and many in the crowd laughed at it. But when it came time for Representative Matt Getz to question her, he understandably blasted her for it. Her comment was uncalled for. It wasn't innocent. She was mocking Baron Trump's name. Some might say I'm overreacting. I'm not. I'm not saying it's the end of the world that she did that. I'm saying that she despises Trump so much that she was unable to see that her comment was over the line. I suspect that it wasn't the first time she said it. And I suspect that just as with the disparaging comment she made regarding conservatives on the Versus Trump podcast, she said it previously in an audience of persons who likewise despise President Trump. And that brings me to what I think this witness shows about the impeachment inquiry. It's aimed at the Democrat base. It's intended to be raw meat for those who despise President Trump. A slip-up like the Barron Trump comment isn't really a slip-up as the Democrat leadership sees it. Their target is the people laughing in the audience and laughing at home, not the people sitting at home watching or listening to the hearing and thinking, that was over the line or that was obnoxious or, man, that woman just hates Trump. Ms. Carlin was intended to show the Democrat base that the Democrats in Congress are willing to go after President Trump, even if, as here, it's a futile effort. And that's truly sad, because we as a country deserve better. Impeachment needs to be the extreme remedy, not the one routinely sought. And as I've demonstrated previously on this podcast, the justification for impeachment has not been shown. Next topic. Have we lost our minds? I want to talk briefly about the latest evidence that some people on Twitter have simply lost their minds. The latest example comes from England. Did you see the terrorist attack on London Bridge? 
It was committed by a knife-wielding Islamist extremist terrorist who'd been released from prison after serving about half his sentence for a prior conviction for plotting to blow up the London Stock Exchange and area pubs. He had even discussed killing Boris Johnson, who was then mayor of London. And this guy was released after serving about half his sentence. After being released, he committed the attack in which he killed two people with a knife while wearing a fake suicide bomb vest that couldn't be determined to be fake during the attack. Notwithstanding that fact, multiple civilians held him at bay, including one using a five-foot-long narwhal tusk that he took from nearby Fishmonger's Hall. That's right. A civilian wielded a horn from the head of a marine mammal as a weapon to hold off a terrorist until the police arrived. You know what they say, that what these attacks call for is a good guy with a narwhal tusk. Now, the most concerning aspect of this is that the terrorist had been released early. Why on earth would he be paroled? This looks like the latest evidence that the bureaucrats who purport to be the so-called experts among our leadership classes in government simply aren't. And that evidence spreads across the Atlantic. It doesn't just exist in America. It apparently exists in the UK as well. But that's not why I titled this segment, Have We Lost Our Minds? I gave it that title because of what someone said on Twitter after the police killed the terrorist, and apparently they weren't alone in expressing the sentiment. They criticized the police for shooting the terrorist while he was apparently lying on the bridge. The tweeter referred to the police shooting as murder. Are you kidding me? The terrorist was wearing a fake suicide bomb vest. So the police are supposed to walk up and give it a close examination to determine it's real before shooting the terrorist? Now, I understand that there's nothing to indicate that the ridiculous thoughts expressed by this particular participant on Twitter are reflective of a substantial portion of the populace. But there's just some things that seem so obvious that we should all be able to agree on them. But in this case, apparently not. Next topic. A man of great vision. Let's talk for a bit about visionaries, and one rarely mentioned visionary in particular. The media celebrates visionaries all the time. They're a core part of pop culture and our country and world history. Certainly over the last few decades, there have been plenty of articles about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and their visions for the future and the companies they created. There's seemingly no end to the publicity that Elon Musk has received and much of it portrays him as a visionary. But I want to talk about one visionary who's rarely discussed. He's not exactly someone nobody's heard of. After all, he does have an airport named after him. But if you ask 10 people on the street who he was, the odds are that none of them would know. I'm talking about Billy Mitchell. So who was Billy Mitchell, and why am I talking about him? Billy Mitchell is generally regarded as the father of the United States Air Force. He served in World War I and eventually came to be commander of all American air combat units in France, and the Milwaukee Airport's named after him. So why do I say that he was a visionary, and why am I talking about him now? He was a visionary because he saw the future of military aviation. And his most shocking prediction is very relevant today. I'm recording this podcast on December 7, Pearl Harbor Day, and Billy Mitchell predicted the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, if you're like me, you've probably read or watched some documentaries about the attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan, the ones that argue that we should have known what was coming, and some really conspiratorial ones that say that we did and did nothing about it. I'm not talking about those. Because Billy Mitchell predicted the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he predicted that attack in 1924. He said that eventually Pearl Harbor would be attacked from the air. He said that in 1924. That's right, he predicted 17 years before the attack 
actually occurred, and he predicted the attack would be launched by Japan. Is there anything more? How much more specific could he have been? Well, quite a bit more specific. He predicted that it would occur on a quiet Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. He predicted it 17 years ahead of time, and he was right as to the day of the week, and he was off by a grand total of only 18 minutes, because it actually came at 7.48 a.m. He was even more prescient than that. You see, actually, Billy Mitchell first predicted a future attack on America by Japan in 1910. Is that all? Well, not really, because Billy Mitchell predicted the attack by the Japanese on Clark Field in the Philippines as well. Only in that instance, he was off by about two hours. He, he slipped a bit on that one. That prediction, by the way, is a bit more personally relevant to me because I lived on Clark Field, then known as Clark Air Base, in the Philippines for a couple of years when my father was stationed there during the Vietnam War. There's a lot more to the General Billy Mitchell story than his visionary nature. He was prone to being insubordinate, and he butted heads with military leadership almost constantly. He demonstrated the power of air attack by sinking decommissioned ships, including a German battleship, in a test that proved embarrassing to the Navy when he demonstrated the superiority of air power over naval shipping. But he went too far when after a series of deadly accidents that occurred around the country with dirigibles and other military aircraft, he publicly criticized the failure to adequately fund military aviation, and he referred to that failure as criminal negligence. As a result, he was court-martialed, and after being convicted and ordered stripped of responsibilities for five years, he resigned. But for me, the thing that stands out about Billy Mitchell is his vision. He saw what was coming. Unfortunately, during his life, not everyone recognized his prescience. In the end, though, it couldn't be ignored. In 1946, ten years after Billy Mitchell's death, he was awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor, the only one of its kind in existence, because it bore the inscription, quote, For Outstanding Pioneer Service and Foresight, in field of American military aviation, close quote. So Billy Mitchell stands out as the only person awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for foresight, for vision. That medal was unique, and Billy Mitchell was definitely unique. How fitting as well that the only military aircraft model in the American arsenal that was named after a specific individual was named the B-25 Mitchell. And even more fitting that it was that model of aircraft that was launched off of aircraft carriers, even though it was an army bomber, in an attack known as the Doolittle Raid, a strike on Tokyo in the aftermath of the Pearl Harbor attack that Billy Mitchell had predicted. Fitting indeed. So as we recognize the bravery of the American sailors and soldiers who gave their lives and risked their lives defending Pearl Harbor against attack on December 7, 1941, we should take a moment to think about the lives that could have been saved if our leaders in the years after World War I had taken Billy Mitchell's warnings to heart. There will always be Americans with great vision. The question will always be whether we recognize it and act on it. Do I have vision? I think so, and I hope you do as well. But I can't contend that I have the vision of Billy Mitchell. I'll be back next week with another episode of Political Spirits to share my vision with you. Please join me. Be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and like the podcast on Facebook at Political Spirits. And follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Franklin Rye. And remember, all episodes are now on YouTube as well. And the YouTube channel is named Political Spirits Network. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And I'm delighted to announce that for the first time, we now have listeners in Wyoming. Welcome aboard and thank you for being a part of Political Spirits. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.